<laughs> but this is going to be our Halloween episode. Oh, cool. Spooky. <laughs> I was trying to think of things like like Halloweeny things we could talk about that would have to do with bagpipes. And there are some stories about like a haunted castle and stuff like that. Maybe we'll look into stuff like that in the future. Oh but... yeah, of course. But Rachel was helping me, you know, Rachel reads a lot. And so she was helping me find like, you know, there was a, there's a Sherlock Holmes story that had to do with bagpipes. Um, but then this one, she mentioned this one, the Nancy drew and the, and the clue of the whistling bagpipes. And I was like that one, that's one that like I've heard of, like since I was a kid, you know, being yeah. bagpiping, I was like, it's about time I read that. It's uh, <laughs> let's let's figure out what what is going on with this book, you know, because you see the cover as like a meme all the all the time, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. But but you, Diana. Well, you know, actually, before I ask you about Nancy Drew stuff, I'm curious. Do you have any cool stuff going on for Halloween? Uh, do you do you and the kids do anything every year, or is it different every year? Or is um, it, is it not a big deal around your house, or is it a super big deal? It's kind of not a big deal around my house. Yeah. I like cute Halloween things mm-hmm. and not like the gross Halloween things. Yeah. <laughs> I might be a wimp. I don't know. I'm just not into it. But um, last year, we because of COVID and stuff, we did right. a stay home Halloween. Well, we had dinner with my parents, I believe. Mm-hmm. So we did like the carrots with the radish on the end. So it looks like fingernails. Oh, of course. And then... Yeah apple slices and you put a little peanut butter on the slice and you put marshmallows on and another slice so it looks like lips and teeth oh yeah so i like doing fun food things like that but not gross cute things right (laughs) so fun food things are my thing um movies and last year for their halloween costumes i got everybody well the two big kids got um the pajama version of their halloween outfit (laughs) so michael oh that's smart (laughs) Yeah, and, Michael and got um, <laughs> the the skeleton pajamas, like onesie zip yeah. up thing, because then they just wear it for pajamas the rest of the year, and right. it gets more the use than just the one day. Yeah. Um, and then Eliana's was Stitch from Lilo and Stitch, mm-hmm. and then Viola did get a costume. She was Batgirl. Oh, awesome! Um, oh, Batgirl. Yeah, because she she actually did dress up for a thing during the day, so. I was I was Batman um I think 9 times as a child. <laughs> nice. Definitely my favorite. Why I don't I wonder if if this is accurate Diana but I feel like you surely are a person who will have seen The Ghost and Mr. Chicken. Is, am I uh, wrong no, about that? I haven't. No. That's no. what was the actor's name who played Barney Fife on the Andy Griffith show? Oh yeah, Don Knotts. Guy? Yeah, Don Knotts. Yeah. It's a Don uh-huh. Knotts movie. It's hilarious. It's uh, what? and I think you would probably love it. I this is me based off my assumption because I know that like you're the reason that I know the movie The Court Jester, for example. Like I know that these sort <laughs> yes. of like these hilarious, campy, older movies are kind of a thing that you would know about. And so yeah, let me suggest that one. Actually, you know what? Wait just a sec. It is funny, but if I'm honest, Diana, when I was a kid, there were some parts of it that did scare the snot right out of me. <laughs> like, it, it, like there's an organ oh, no. that plays itself and like a painting that has like gardening shears stuck in it at one point and stuff so th- i don't know maybe it actually is s- scary it's not nuts uh-huh. though so it's also funny so i don't know oh okay i i recommend it and also kind of give you a ca- caveat at the same time <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay there were a few shows like that though i remember when i was a kid i also my my uncle brought home watcher in the woods which it was like disney produced that and so it was like oh it's probably safe and that movie messed me up for a long time oh no i did you ever see that one i haven't seen that one either no yeah, yeah that one was scary that and something like well anyway anyway we don't have to talk about scary movies happy <laughs> halloween everybody if you like happy scary halloween. movies go go watch some but what we're going to talk about today is uh, our mysteries is that still halloweeny i guess that, now i'm kind of like ah it's a mystery is it scary i don't know there's a chapter called like the phantom piper it's halloweeny enough yeah it'll yeah. do what other excuse do we have really to to do a uh, dive into a Nancy Drew book on a bagpiping podcast, right? <laughs> right. So, are you you're familiar with Nancy Drew other than this book, though, right? Yes. Because I remember you mentioning that. Um, in fact, you were one of the very first, very first, maybe the very first interview. It was you or Heidi, and then the other was the other one that we when I first started the podcast. And I remember you mentioning that you liked uh, like mystery novels and also like 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 police, like crime yeah, solving yeah. TV shows and stuff like that. Correct. So, have you read all the Nancy Drew books? Um, no, but 
close, probably. No, I started reading them when I was like um, nine or ten, I think. Mm -hmm. And it was it was like the thing that hooked me on like compulsively reading forever. Mm -hmm. And so my mom was really nice and just let me go with it. And we would go so like in the summer um, in middle school, we'd go to the library once a week and I would check out like eight or ten Nancy Drew books <laughs> and, and read them within like three days. <laughs> like, wow. it was crazy. I would just have stacks. I'm like, do they come bigger? <laughs> <laughs> you need like a, just like a giant tome anthology of all the Nancy Drew books. Yes. Yes. That would be fantastic. So I do have my own small collection of Nancy Drew books here at the house. Yeah. Um, they're my like when my brain is too full, but I really want to read a book, then I'll just read one of oh, those. Oh, sure. Like, enjoyable, but you don't have to, like, work to understand it kind of thing. Like, <laughs> right, it can, yeah. It can be a calming experience. Yeah, they got me through school a lot. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. Do you have any favorites that stand out? Um, if you're, like, you know, if you're somebody like me, who I, the only Nancy Drew book I've ever read now is The Clue of the Whistling Bagpipes. So if <laughs> someone like me comes to you and says, hey, I want to start reading some Nancy Drew books. What are some good ones? Where should I start? Ooh, um, I don't think I have any one favorite one, but I do have, like, um, the ones that I read very first that oh, made sure. me fall in love with Nancy Drew yeah. that I, like, just hold dearly just because they are the first ones that I read. Mm -hmm. So there's, like, the Larkspur Lane and the, I can't remember, the clock. Oh, the... I've seen, I've seen the cover of the clock one. yeah. She's yeah. like in the middle of a field with this like, yeah. little clock, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. And then there's like the, I can't remember if it's 99 Steps or the Staircase or something like mm. that. I, I guess I should remember the, that's the problem with reading, you know, 10 of them in four days. <laughs> right. You don't yeah. really read. They blend together. <laughs> they kind of blend together. <laughs> no. Yeah. I like them a lot. It's funny. My, my wife has mentioned that before when we've talked about reading because I'm so envious of people like you and her who can, who can read. Like I like reading but I don't read super fast in spite of trying to. And it's not just like, you know, words per minute. I have a decent speed when it comes to words per minute, though certainly nothing impressive. But like, it's like I, I fall asleep really easily and things like that, you know, so like <laughs> yeah. I never get very far. Yeah. Um, and and so like Rachel will say to me, like, like I'll, 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 I'll remember a line or a part of a book and be like, oh yeah, I remember when this happened, you know? And she'll be like, I don't know how you can remember such detail. You know, like I can't remember that kind of detail from the books that I've read. And I'm like, look, look, the honest truth is you've read more than 10 times the number of books that I've read in my life. You know, it's just a question of quantity. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I've only read four books, so I can remember all of them, you know, she's read hundreds of <laughs> yeah. books, and so she can't remember all of them, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I, you know, you mentioning those few titles reminded me of a game that I, I was aware of years and years ago where people would take Nancy Drew books, just the images from the front. And then you would try to guess what the title and plot of the book was just based off the picture on the Ooh, front. That sounds like a fun game. I would play that game. Yeah. And, you know, in my memory, it was just like a, an internet game, you know. But, like, I, I do wonder, like, hmm, would this be marketable? You know, could you make it like a deck of cards, right, where you just, like, lay, out, lay them out, you get dealt three of them, and then it could be like one of those. Uh, what was that game that you, you and Kevin and Heather and Rachel and I played that game where um, it was like – you got like the elements for like a news headline or for a story and you had to give like a synopsis for what that story was. And then somebody would judge to say this was the best one, you know? Oh, right. Yeah. Like how plausible it would be. Right. Yeah. I don't remember the name of that game, well, but it, it could be similar to that one. Yeah. All right on. So now the, the book at hand, Nancy Drew and the clue of the whistling bagpipes. Had you read this one before? Yeah. I read this one as a kid. Um, probably before I actually learned how to play the bagpipes. Um, Did but then I didn't read it again until like a year ago. My daughter got it from the library. Oh yeah. Yeah. Did this book, um, either inspire you to play bagpipes or set you up with some unrealistic expectations for what it would be like to play bagpipes? 
No, but the Nancy Drew series set me up for unrealistic expectations of what like an 18 year old does. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. No. In real life. I like as a as a or at least in my household as like a mid 30 year old uh man right mid 30s guy here who had never read Nancy Drew before that was some of the most entertaining stuff to me was just reading about like getting these hints at what her life is like and just being like holy moly what <laughs> right. a great life <laughs> yeah so I'm reading these as like a 10 year old and I'm like I cannot wait to be 18 not in school, have a convertible, right, be able to go and do things with girlfriends all the time, not have Travel to tell anyone where I'm going. Not to mention get a boyfriend like Ned Nickerson. That boy sounds like a dreamboat. Oh, oh yeah, the boyfriend that's in college, yeah, right? That's right? She doesn't go to college. <laughs> She's, she doesn't have to deal with classes or a schedule or anything. Yeah, well, I mean, why? why but why would she, right? Uh, right. What decade were these were these coming out? Do you know? Uh, whatever whatever it was it was like uh it was definitely like well they came out the typists at the time or something like that right sure, yeah right? <laughs> when they when they first first came out yeah and then um they like keep um do they kind of modernize as they go along yeah they like keep modernizing it oh, a little I bit see. and keep updating her so she never grows older mm. um but they do modernize it a little bit more and more and more each each I time. See. I see. So it's like the cast of Arthur on PBS. Always in right. Grade. Fourth grade for 25 years. Yes. Yeah. Did you <laughs> it's just like that. Next year. I did. Yeah. Uh, everybody's. Going I, and I saw a picture of Arthur with like a cell phone and I was like, he yeah, doesn't exactly. have a cell phone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's exactly what I was thinking too. Like, oh yeah, he's still in fourth grade, but now he's like a current fourth grader. Yeah. Okay. So the copyright date on... The Whistling Bagpipes um, is 1964. 64, huh? Hmm. Yeah. Well, Nancy Drew was For this not, one. And it's like 40. Sure. Yeah. So this is book 41, I think. Yeah, it's in the 40s, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, so let me... Let, how about, Diana, would you be willing to read the, the introduction? All right. <clears throat> Warnings not to go to Scotland can't stop Nancy Drew from setting out on a thrill-packed mystery adventure. Undaunted by the vicious threats, the attractive young detective That's with her father is. and her two <laughs> close friends goes to, goes to visit her great-grandmother at an imposing estate in the Scottish Highlands and to solve the mystery of a missing family heirloom. And there is another mystery to be solved, the fate of the flocks of stolen sheep. Baffling clues challenge Nancy's powers of deduction. A note written in the ancient Gaelic language, a deserted houseboat on Loch Lomond, a sinister red bearded stranger in Edinburgh, eerie whistling noises in the Highlands, startling discoveries in an old castle and in the ruins of a prehistoric fortress on a rugged mountain slope and in a secluded glen lead, Nancy's, lead Nancy closer to finding the solution to both mysteries. Wearing a time-honored tartan, Nancy climbs the mountain of Ben Nevis of uh, Ben... Yeah, I, I don't know how to say that I one, James. I don't know either that Nevis or Nevis or, or Nevis. I'm not sure. We'll either. call it Nevis. Okay. <laughs> Nancy climbs the mountain of Ben Nevis in the dark of night and plays a tune of historic heroism on the bagpipes, all part of her daring plan to trap the sheep thieves and recover the valuable family heirloom. Beautiful. So that's the story we're diving into, and it is a, an action-packed adventure, that's for sure. Oh, and just, just so you know real quick, Diana, as we go along here, we're going to give this book a bagpipe score. Oh, good. Okay. So here's the system that I'm thinking. Well, to be fair, anything good about this system really came from Rachel. She's a lot smarter than me. <laughs> and if it, if it doesn't go well, it's because I tweaked it, so that would be my fault. But here's what we're going to do. Um, every time that we encounter uh, sort of like information about bagpipes or a character interacting with bagpipes, uh -huh. we're going to score that on a scale from 1 to 10 for accuracy. Like, is this realistic? Yes. A realistic de okay. description of bagpipes. But there are two score variation things that can happen. One is we, ask, we have to ask ourselves the question, is it entertaining? And if it is it gets a plus one to the score. Okay. Right? So if it scores only at like a seven, but it's actually really entertaining, it's actually going to get an eight. Okay. But then the other question we have to ask ourselves is, would this inspire someone to learn bagpipes? You know, if someone's reading this, would this make them go, I want to learn to play bagpipes. And if it does, it gets a plus two. 
to this. Okay. Story. So, after we've tallied all, we'll we'll put those all together every time we encounter bagpipes, and then we'll tally it up at the end and see just how this how this story stacks up against our, our rigorous grading system. <laughs> awesome. So, Nancy's um, maternal great grandmother, Lady Douglas, uh, has called to Mister Drew. Now that's that's her dad, and you know mm-hmm. maybe we should do a quick run through of the main characters, right? What um what do you, what could you tell me about Nancy Drew if you were going to describe her since you know her a lot better than I do? Uh, Nancy Drew, she's I think she's about like eighteen, nineteen years old. Um, she lives in the Midwest, I believe. I, I wondered all throughout where River Heights is. is I this think whole story happens in Scotland, so I never got good clues as to where Nancy was from. Right. From what I can tell, <laughs> I don't know. I was figuring this out when I was like twelve. I think it's like Midwest. Mm-hmm. Um. And um, she's always uh, beautiful. Her introduction in all of the books is just like in your introduction, mm-hmm. the the attractive young detective. Right. One of my favorite um, lines was um, in the at the beginning of the story. The maid says, um, or the maid thinks to herself, you know, that describes the maid as thinking, she was proud of the slender, attractive, titian-haired girl whose penchant for solving mysteries had be brought the family fame and respect. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep, so she's a strawberry blonde girl, um, has a good education, um, comes from money. Her dad's a lawyer. She has her own car. Um, She's quite smart. She figures out all of these um, mysteries, and she's well known in her own, like, hometown um, for the work that she does. Um, But she's also, like, they've given her good qualities. Like, she's a really good friend, very, like an honorable character type of thing um someone someone you want to grow up to be like right right yeah yes and so then and you mentioned her dad that's mr drew uh Mm -hmm. he's a lawyer Um, yes i do have this description from this book where it introduces both him and ned nickerson it says um ned nickerson stood there a wide grin on his handsome face Nancy thought that next to her good-looking athletic father, this special friend of hers was the nicest man she knew. He stood high in his classes at Emerson College, played football, and recently had been sent on a special assignment to South America in connection with his courses. And later, Ned also offers to drive them to the airport, so you know he's, a, he's quite the boyfriend. So there we get an intro for Mr. Drew as well as uh, Ned Nickerson. Yes, yes, the boyfriend that the dad apparently really likes, too. Yes, well, it sounds like they're <laughs> cut from the same mold, so like, they get along <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, yes. Um, so, yeah, so Mr. Drew is the dad. He's a lawyer, um, and he's pretty, like, I guess, I, I don't know, pretty hands-off as far as a dad goes. I don't know. <laughs> I, got, I definitely got that vibe from this book. Yeah, it's like, oh, this guy was trying to kill us down the Royal Mile, Dad, uh, but tomorrow we're going to go see this castle all by ourselves. Yeah, you should do that. Rent a car. Go have fun. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yes. Yeah. So, um, very, very lenient father figure, I feel like. I don't know. I'm 33, and my dad doesn't let me, like, go camping by myself with my kids. 33 with your own kids right? in your own house yeah. and your own truck and trailer. <laughs> yes. So, we'll, we'll go camping, and I'll be like, oh, I want to go explore down there. And no matter what my dad is doing, he always comes with us. Yeah. <laughs> it's great. He was, he was a, was he a highway, highway patrolman or a Yes. Police? Uh-huh. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure he has, like, many decades of learned vigilance that is uh, just built in at this point. Yes. Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, and then, so there's the dad, there's Nancy, her boyfriend, Ned. Um, there's the um, the housekeeper. Um, she's only there for, like, the beginning of this book. In other right. books, she has more, like, speaking parts, I guess oh, you could I say. Um, but she's kind of like a... Uh, an advice. Nancy goes to the housekeeper for advice sometimes. Um, Nancy's Nancy's mother has passed away. Is that right? Yes. And so yes. maybe the housekeeper kind of is a stand-in in some ways for the the matriarch figure or something like that. Right. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. Yep. And then Nancy has two best friends that join her on pretty much every mystery. So there's Bess, who I believe has blonde hair oh, that goes does. to her shoulders um, yeah yes. the, the first time we get best described in this book and keep in mind this is the first time that i meet any of these characters personally 
Bess is described as Nancy's blonde, slightly plump, but very attractive friend. Yes. <laughs> and through the whole book, it's always Bess who's like, I could do with a meal right now. This is a nice place for a picnic. Aren't we past time for lunch? <laughs> like, just on and on about Bess. <laughs> yes. I actually really like Bess um, because she's blonde and she's all about the food. <laughs> And that's how she's described in, like, every book. She's, because her, the other friend is George, which is Bess's cousin. Mm -hmm. And George is the short-haired tomboy athletic one. Mm -hmm. So, which, I like the tomboy, like, I was a tomboy growing up too, but not at all athletic. My mm -hmm. poor children got that mm -hmm. from me. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, so there's George and Bess, and they both... Um, go on all of these adventures with Nancy. Okay, perfect. And that's and that's exactly how this book starts. Um, Nancy, let's see. So Nancy's dad, since he's a lawyer, he gets a, a call or a letter or something from uh, Lady Douglas, who um, was Nancy's. Let's see. Was I can't remember now. Was was is Nancy related to Lady Douglas through her mother's side or her father's side? I believe the mother's side. Yeah, that makes sense. And so Lady Douglas is going to, she has this like fancy estate in Scotland that she's going to turn over to like the National Trust. Mm -hmm. um, and she wants to give a priceless family heirloom to Nancy, but it's gone missing. But also as part of the paperwork stuff for turning over the trust, she needs Mr. Drew's lawyer skills. Yes, so that's, I believe so. That's like the, that's like how we get them over to Scotland, right? But, but. Um, we got to have Bess and George come too, right? Right. And so, uh, and so George uh, calls Nancy and says, hey, I uh, submitted this photograph of you with a magnifying glass looking for clues, uh, probably on one of the past adventures that I didn't know about. I'd imagine this is actually from one of the other stories, mm -hmm. um, to this magazine called uh, Photography Internationale. And uh, I won uh, a prize. And the prize is... Uh, two round trip tickets to Scotland. <laughs> Convenient. Uh, yes. so like the very after the very evening that Nancy says, Yes, let's go to Scotland, she gets a call from Bess. Bess says, I've got two tickets. Do you want one? Nancy's like, I already got have posit passage to Scotland. And so she's like, Oh, I'll bring George. So the crew's back together for another adventure. Yep. Perfect. So so then on their way to the airport, they're getting everything ready and then they they head off to the airport and on their way there they stop in um I think it was in New York. Yeah. Well, um, oh, before ahead. well before they leave, um, Nancy has dinner I think with her dad and Ned, and Ned is like, "Oh, oh I've right. been I that, read yeah. that there's you know someone is stealing sheep in Scotland because that's totally news that we get in America." Yeah, but sheep um, in Scotland. <laughs> yeah, so it's so Ned hears of these Emerson. like <laughs> sheep rustlers. Yeah. Um, so I guess Nancy decides that she's just going to solve all the mysteries while she's in Scotland and just oh. make it a whole trip. Right. And then I, I, I skipped so much action. That's also, as they're sitting there talking about all of this, a truck crashes into her beautiful convertible. Yes. They get a mysterious warning letter and then a bomb goes off in their mailbox. <laughs> yes. And, oh, what was it? They found, they, the truck was abandoned. The one that had crashed into the, into her car. And they yeah, they don't know who it was. Piece of tartan material in the seat. Oh right, right. So the the clues begin to pop up, and it's mm -hmm. and also like immediately the moment they decide to go to Scotland, it seems apparent that someone doesn't want them to go. Yes. So then they take off. But it doesn't know. deter her. She yep, goes anyways. <laughs> Bomb threats, no big deal. So um, then they head off to um, Scotland. Oh, man, I keep skipping important details. That She also has, um, I don't remember what they were doing in some shops or something, but she she now has undesired fame because of the mm -hmm. photo that Bess had submitted, right? Yes. And uh, and, and people, people are, like, asking for her autograph right. and stopping her in the street. And she's getting frustrated because she can't do her, like, sneaky detective work undercover because everyone keeps recognizing her. Yeah. Oh, that's right. She was trying to figure out who had written the letter, right? I think so, yeah. Yeah. And so then there's this little thing where like this poor little boy gets an, gets this gets an autograph from her, but then this mysterious man like buys it from the little boy or something like that. Uh -huh. And uh, yeah, 
and then they head to the airport. <laughs> yes. But they don't go directly to Scotland. Right. They make a stop first in yeah. New York. They stop in New York, and this is where we first encounter some bagpipe talk. Um, let's see. We've got a little bit of back and forth here. What if, let's see, what if we do um, you be Nancy Drew, and I'll be her aunt? <laughs> Okay. I'm her aunt. Now, I'm assuming that this is in reference to a practice chanter. It's got to be, right? It has to be. Yeah, there's no... Yeah. So, I'm Aunt Eloise, and you're Nancy Drew. Um, and we're at okay. we're at my house. Go ahead. Okay. Oh, I, and I, as Aunt Eloise, I just... I was just like, oh, you're going to Scotland? Look, I have a practice chanter here in my, in my, in my bureau. You know, something like <laughs> yes. that, right? I pull it out. Yep. May I try the chanter? Yes, indeed. But first, I'll show you what the notes are and how you hold the fingers. Nancy adjusted her hands properly. Then Aunt Eloise said, Now, just blow into the chanter, raising your various fingers. Don't try any tunes until you get used to moving your fingers. Oh, I guess there aren't a lot more lines for Nancy. Here. Okay, I'll read the <laughs> next one. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> At first, Nancy could not hold the chanter and play it at the same time, so her aunt suggested that she sit down and let the lower end of the instrument rest in her lap. In a few moments, Nancy was playing the scales quite credibly. Then George pops in. I dare you to try Scott's Wahey. <laughs> oh, and then Aunt Eloise says, play it first without the grace notes. Of course, they're what gives the charm to the music of bagpipes. And you want to finish it off? And in a few minutes, Nancy was playing the melody of Scots Wahey, and after some more practice, she was able, by following the instruction book, to add the grace notes to the first phrase. All right. So, let's open the debate. How credible is this? <laughs> okay. There are some really good parts, so we can cover that first. <laughs> yeah. What's good about this? Um, so, first showing what the notes are and how to hold your fingers. And that's that's credible. credible. Yep. Um, I was really surprised to encounter Aunt Eloise suggesting that she sits down to rest yes. at the lower end of the chanter in her lap. Uh huh. That makes me think whoever wrote this talked to somebody who plays bagpipes because that I don't think I can't. I have a hard time imagining how anyone would think of that if they didn't know right that that's a thing. Right, and then um, when Aunt Eloise says, "Don't try any tunes until you get used to moving your fingers." That's also credible. I yeah. tell my students that, like, don't try playing Star Wars until you actually know what the notes are. <laughs> or it won't sound good. Yeah. So that's also good. Um, and when Nancy, because Nancy, like, at first can't hold the chanter at the same time and play. Yeah, so mm -hmm. sitting down. And then, um, and then, and Eloise also says, play it first without the grace notes. Mm -hmm. And then you can add it later because that's what is unique about bagpipe music. That's also very credible. It's also credible that Scott's Wahey would be the first tune yeah. that she would play. Mm -hmm. That's pretty common as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, there's actually a lot in here that I don't think is just intuitive. So I do think, like, somebody was doing some research. I think so, yeah, yeah. But and what, I liked the oh, fact what? that they had an instruction book that they were following. yeah. yeah. So my teacher brain was very glad to see that there was some actual Did instruction. You, you, you start trying to imagine which instruction book it is. Oh, I pictured like the old one, like the old plaid one yeah, with the that I learned out it. of. Yep, that's yeah, exactly what I imagined too. But maybe yep. just because of the age, right? Like it couldn't have been the the uh, College of Piping purple book. No, right? that one's too new. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I, I pictured the the old, like, bagpipe instructional books that are, like, 20 pages long. And it's like, you can play bagpipes now right. after 20 pages. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> yeah. So, and then that's where we come to this, where she's in one sitting and can play Scott's Wahey with grace notes in the yeah. first phrase. <laughs> Pretty darn good. Now, and honestly, when as I was reading this, Diana, I was kind of like, okay, that's impossible. But then, as it kind of bounced around in my brain for a minute i thought i better ask diana about it because honestly i begin to think maybe the typical rules don't apply to nancy drew in the same way that like are we reading a superhero novel you know to some degree? right right so like could peter parker do something that nobody else could you know and so like is that kind of the situation here is it like nancy blowing everyone's mind she's the only person in the world who could do this could play scott's Wahey in one sitting <laughs> Um, probably. Um, I mean, if you, 
include, like, all of her, like, I mean, she's 18. She travels all over the world by herself or with her girlfriends. Things happen to her, and she shoves caution to the wind, and well, her we're on both, father... Like, we're like book 41. She's not dead yet, right? So right, she's yeah. pretty good at something. Yeah, she's been kidnapped at least 40 times that we know so far, <laughs> right? right? So... At least one per book, so... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so, I mean, as far as Nancy is, she's not really bad at anything, <laughs> that I've come across so yeah. far. So, yes, picking up the bagpipes, I, I wasn't really surprised to see that she could play Scott Swahe. So should we take Nancy's superhuman abilities into consideration when we decide whether or not this is overall credible? Or should we treat this like, is this credible for a normal human? Um, Let's do for a normal human. Okay. Um, Like if they were to read this and be like, oh, this would be something I want to try. Mm -hmm. um no you probably won't be playing scott swahe mm -hmm. in your first sitting unless okay i will give it to you if you are already doing a large amount of music and you already know like music theory you already know the basics of a couple of instruments maybe especially if it's like saxophone or clarinet or something right like independent finger dexterous stuff yeah dexter yeah so uh, yeah, like if I were to give the band teacher a chanter, and um, which I did actually last week, mm -hmm. I was like, here's a chanter. This is where your fingers go. He was playing a scale within like 20 minutes accurately, okay. right? So I guess if it was a person that, you know, had a music background, already had, you know, the basics of music theory and things like that and didn't have to learn how to read music... I guess you could say it's possible they could get Scott's way out in one sitting. Okay. So definitely this bit where it says that Nancy, was, after a few minutes, Nancy was playing the scale quite credibly. And then, you know, some more minutes she had Scott's way pretty well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's kind of making me like, initially I was going to be like, all right, this is starting at like a four at the best for me. Like one <laughs> out of ten. But now I'm kind of thinking like, no, okay, you're right. Like maybe, I didn't read the other 40 novels that led up to this one. Right. So maybe Nancy has played a lot of other musical instruments. So maybe if we take into consideration all of these, maybe I'm thinking, like, for mm -hmm. me, maybe I could start this off at, like, a six. I think yeah. so, yeah. Yeah. And I, I re-looked up Scott's Wahey. I don't play it very often. Yeah, but I looked it up just to check, and the only grace note is the G grace note. Mm. So it's only one of our grace notes that she would have to add in to the scale notes. Man, once again, I'm beginning to be, like, super impressed by whoever wrote this, like, it's actually pretty darn good. Not 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 quite the... <laughs> I expected it to be a lot worse, at least, you know? Yes. Yeah, I mean, for picking which tune and everything, like, if they were like, she played Pumpkin's Fancy or, you know, something <laughs> elaborate, I'd be like, oh. Yeah. But really, Scott's Way is a very basic tune with mm. an easy, repetitive melody line. So... So you, feel, so you feel good if we start this at a six? Yeah. Okay, so yes. we started at six. Now, does it um, is it entertaining? Is it especially entertaining? Like enough that it deserves another point? Hmm. I don't know. What do you think on that one? I don't know. I, I I don't think so. Yeah. So it stays at a six. But would it in, would it help? Would it inspire somebody to learn bagpipes? Like, I kind of think maybe yes, just because it kind of presents what the beginning process is. And so, like, maybe kind of lays it out and makes it seem like, oh, that's not too complicated. Maybe I could try this. But yeah. At the same time, I would worry about it setting up false expectations for someone, you know. <laughs> finish one sitting and not be able to play Scott's Wahe and be disappointed, but. Um, no, if someone came to me and said, I read Nancy Drew. She learned how to play bagpipes. I want to learn Scott's Wahe by the time I leave here. I'd be like, okay, <laughs> I will show you the first line of Scott's Wahe. Yeah. Do it. So I, I feel like I could get someone uh, in onto Scott's way hey, within like an hour lesson or something maybe. Okay. If they had, I mean, it would help if they had basic music knowledge. <laughs> right. So with a couple caveats, let's say yeah. I think it gets the the two, the two bonus point points then. Okay. Um. So that's an eight. That first one is an eight. Scores eight for bagpipe accuracy. Good work, Nancy Drew. All right. So. From her Aunt Eloise's house, having uh, learned Scots Wahey, they continue onto the plane. You know that this was written in a bygone era because they say that this was a luxuriously furnished plane with comfortable seats. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> literally unheard of in this day and age. Um, then they check into a hotel, and they accidentally get checked into the wrong room. A room yes. that was apparently booked for Mr. Dewar, not Drew. Yes. So before they figure out that they're in the wrong room, they, um, they're kind of like putting their stuff away, and they find this mysterious paper uh, inside of one of the drawers in the room. And it's got some Gaelic words written on it. How's your how's your Gaelic, Diana? Do you feel like you can? Oh man, Gaelic words. I am not good at Gaelic at all. I can do like the uniform parts. Yeah. <laughs> but that is it. I'm I'm not even confident with that, honestly. Like if I'm doing like a school assembly or something, I'm like, well, this is called a skin do. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah, my yeah, my pronunciations have a very um, pace in Utah accent. <laughs> right, <yeah. laughs> this is how the Highlanders would have said it if they were from pace in Utah. That's about right. <laughs> but it's got some words on it. Uh, some, some Gaelic words that are in the book. So you can read them and, and, and not say them out loud, I suppose. And you'll recognize them if they come up in the story later. Hint. And then we've got some drawings on that paper as well. There's a bagpipe. There's a cradle that's shaped like a boat. And there's a small building. And I, I got to say, I, I would like to see the drawing of a cradle that's shaped like a boat that's identifiable as a baby's cradle that is also (laughs) shaped like a boat and not like i feel like if i saw that i would go oh it's a boat you know so yeah i'm not sure how but that's fine we're not here to judge the uh, artistic accuracy uh, the visual art just the bagpipes and then what else uh mr drew starts uh starts on his his interviews and stuff he has to do so the girls rent a car and they're gonna go do some sightseeing Mm -hmm. Um, So they're going to go see the University of Glasgow, which is described as being both old and famous, and uh, Loch Lomond. They're going to head to Mm -hmm. Loch Lomond. Um, Would you like to read this next little bit that describes what it was like as they were driving to Loch Lomond? Uh, Yes. Um, Let's see, who's talking? Do you remember? Uh, I think this was actually Nancy. Um, Yeah, I'm pretty sure that is Nancy. Oh, because she's talking to the driver, I think. Oh, that's right. That's right. I think they get a driver at first. They did have a driver at first. You're right. Yeah. Okay. So she says, left side of the road driving has always puzzled me. How did the custom start? The Scotswoman said that the only explanation... Bad idea. (laughs) Um, And then the driver says, "'Tis said a raider would hold the reins in the left hand and keep a sword in the right, ready to deal with any highwayman coming on horseback from the opposite direction." Now, I did, because of this, I Googled around a little bit. Because Nancy, of course, is coming from the United States, where you drive on the right side of the road. Mm -hmm. And so she's like, oh, how did you ever start driving on the left side of the road here in Scotland? It's so so quirky and strange, right? And this explanation is given. And it may be a credible explanation. I don't don't know. Maybe that is why people drive on the left side of the road. But I I looked it up because I'd never looked it up before. I always assumed, I don't know, maybe it's American exceptionalism in my imagination. I think it's just because of, like, Henry Ford. And so it feels like... Uh, the the car started here you know without thinking of like wagons and horses and stuff previous to the the motor vehicle you know but i'd always kind of thought like uh it was just like an accident like it's too bad we all didn't just start driving on the correct side of the road or like the same side of the road you know right, right. in the beginning and stuff but what i looked up was that after the Ameri- after the the after the revolutionary war here in the united states or maybe even a little while before as basically just as a way to spite the british Everybody in the colonies started driving on the right side of the road because the left side of the road had been standard until then. <laughs> and so, like, if we want to, like, argue about what is the original way to drive, you know, it's definitely the left side of the road. And then it was just the colonists who were like, oh, we hate the British. Let's do everything we can opposite to what the British do. We're driving on the other side. And it's stuck to this day. I want to know who that guy was where he's like, in this town, we yeah. drive on the right side of the road. Well, and how many awkward, like confrontations would you have to go through before people finally get on board right because surely there'd be other people like ah that's not it doesn't even matter bill you know like just keep driving (laughs) like we always have and you know face to like their horses nose to nose get on the other side of the road no bill we've always driven this way you know (laughs) yeah that's what i imagine catch on (laughs) Uh, oh there you go How, how do you feel about um carrying us through the Loch lomond adventure um yeah so while they're um i'm trying to remember do they get run off the road and then go to Loch lomond yeah it was i think it was, yeah it was after they got run off the road 
because then because they they're the staying woman. at the lady's house, right? Right. Well, no. Well, that's after they get driven off of a. Um, they were gonna go on a ferry and get pushed off the ferry, and then they end up staying at a lady's house. Oh, okay. Later, so they get they get pushed around in vehicles quite a bit <laughs> in this book. <laughs> I think this one okay. they were just headed I to think... Loch Lomond to see it, and then... and then it's the storm. Mm-hmm. That's right. Okay, I'm there. Okay. So they go visit Loch Lomond. A storm blows in right when they're there, and there's houseboats all along this lake. I want. Are, um, are there houseboats on Loch Lomond? That I don't know. I've never like pictured that in my mind, but I guess there would be. Yeah, why not? Right. It feels kind of like it should be like a national park or something, right? Right. Yeah. That I think in my mind I picture it more like a national park and yeah. not really like people live there. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, which is probably. It's probably more true that people live there (laughs) on the water. Um, So this big storm comes in and a houseboat tips over or floats into the lake. Yeah. Yeah. It tips over. That's right. Because I remember they had to like, they had to like dangle down. They like, yeah. Because they have to like dangle down in the door and rescue this mom and the girl and the little girl. Yeah. Um, And so they save them and then Nancy like interrogates them while yeah, they're right. cold and wet and their house is sideways right <laughs> yeah i know you've got a lot to think about right now poor lady uh I've got um, some questions <laughs> yeah so nancy asks them about the area and about the houseboats and they find out they find out that one of the houseboats is empty um except for these strange men that come and visit it right that's right yeah and they, and i can't remember they come and go only at night and Maybe mm-hmm. move boxes. Suspicious stuff. Yeah. Um. And then, does someone recognize her here from I, her photograph in the newspaper? I think so. Like, people are recognizing her everywhere. In fact, I wonder, I can't remember now, does the mom even recognize her? Like, after they rescue her, like, she's soaking wet, the storm is raging all around them, and she's like, you're the girl who I saw on the cover of Photography National. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> I think so. Which is funny because, like, I never recognize anyone. Yeah. You can be driving down the road, and I just will not see who is yeah. driving the car. I I just well, don't recognize people I publicly mean, at all. It's just Nancy Drew was that remarkably attractive that everybody, <laughs> every everybody would recognize her. Right, right, yes. So, then... um, so they, they get the mom and the daughter squared away. They get them some help and everything. And then Nancy and her two friends go to the hotel. Right. And Bess especially is soaked because if I remember right, she's so clumsy as well as really loving food that she falls over a lot and she fell into the water. Right. I think so. Yeah. So like they're all wet, but Bess is especially uncomfortable. And then yeah. they get back to the hotel. And this is one of the parts that like, I don't know, I think we should probably score this one. As Nancy's walking past the hotel room that they had previously been incorrectly assigned, she says mm-hmm. that she hears someone inside playing the bagpipes. Yes, this part. <laughs> Do you want to know how many times I've played my bagpipes in a hotel room? Tell me. <laughs> None. I don't yeah. think I ever have. If you ever did? How well do you think it would, like, how long could you possibly be playing Scots Wahey in your hotel room on the bagpipes <laughs> before you'd have a lot of people telling you to stop? Right. Like, in Scotland. Like. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Oh, man. So I think uh, right off the bat, I'm giving that a credibility score of, like, two. Because, like, maybe you could get away with it for a little while, for a few minutes, until basically, basically until fig- people figured out which room it was coming from. And I don't think you could do <laughs> yeah. it for any longer than yeah. that. I've, I've played my practice chanter in a hotel room. So if it were, like, a smaller, like, because when you say bagpipes, I think of, like, Great Highland bagpipes, right? And so I if think it were like you know, I don't think small don't pipes. Think small pipes enter into this story. I think we can just assume G H. Yeah, already. the picture on the front of the book is High- Great Highland bagpipes. Yeah. So we're I'm assuming it's Great Highland bagpipes. Yeah. So I'm, yeah, I yeah, agree too. Assumption. So I'm giving that a credibility score of two on my part. What do you think? You want to go higher? Agree. Or we'll just average it. I agree with two. Yeah. Okay. And I don't think it's even worth the conversation as to whether that's particularly entertaining or inspires anyone to play. Although I like the idea, oh, can we spoil the ending? Oh yeah, let's spoil it. Um, I like the idea that the bad guy is 
practicing his bagpipes. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> this, this of villain, all the other things he could be doing. Right, this terrible villain who is also a very studious student of the bagpipes, right? He's very committed to his practice. I have to play the tune right. I have to get it right or they won't know what that they're supposed to do. Even even villains do even even sheep thieves uh, keep up with their uh, their dojo university uh, hundred day challenge right yes don't yes. let a single day go by no excuses <laughs> so if if this encounter has any good things the guy was practicing okay so that's fair you know what I I will give it that I'm gonna give it a bonus point I'm gonna call okay. that a three then because it's a great example that you know you're never too busy to practice your bagpipes. <laughs> Even if you're stealing sheep and running teenage girls off the road in their cars and all kinds of other shenanigans. Yep. So then Nancy and her friends are talking about um, what they should do the next day. And they decide, Nancy's like, I'd like to go see a bagpipe factory and see how they're made. Yes. yes. She's like, I, I think if I saw how they're made, maybe I'll be able to play better. Which, you know. Okay, we did so good until like the very last of that sentence. <laughs> so that's what I would like to know, Diana. Um <laughs> Do you feel like understanding uh, how bagpipes work makes you play better? Ooh. No. <laughs> like, Not really. I, I feel like maybe eventually, like after you've been learning, right? After you've been learning for a while, then like learning more about how the reeds work makes it so you can work on the reeds more, that kind of thing, right? Yeah, but, yeah. But if like you're knowing... Nancy, who's had one session, <laughs> right? Yeah, but like you've been playing bagpipes for 20. 20. 20 years yeah about 20 years yeah but like how bagpipes are made like they're turned on a lathe right right that's um right. You, you like how much do you really know about how they're made made that, that's a very good point i'm th i was when i said that i was thinking i guess i really was to be more accurate i was thinking more like how they function but that's right. not what nancy is saying she's saying how they're made right yeah that's she's like at a factory of like where they turn the wood they cut it in small pieces um, they get the bags, they stamp the hole in the bag. Like, mm -hmm. I didn't know any of that the first lots of years that I played bagpipes. You go a long time <laughs> not knowing that and still play pretty well. That's pretty yeah. much true. Now, I, yeah. and I did, I did wonder, I was like, bagpipe factory? I was like, wait, like, I feel like when I think of a bagpipe maker, it's definitely a workshop situation, you know? Oh, okay. Yeah. Ways, that kind of thing. So I did Google around a little bit and I was just like, are there bagpipe factories? And I was a bit surprised, but then thought about it and made sense. One of the first things that came up when I searched Bagpipe Factory was McCallum's website. And I was like, yeah, they turn out okay. a lot of yes. units. Yes. And so so they, when they I read like, that but, now, that's yeah. what I pictured was the McCallum factory that I've right. only seen pictures of. But as far as like Nancy going to visit a bagpipe factory, that is on my bucket list oh, in real cool. life. So yeah. that one gets points, yeah. but not like... I'm not like, I need to go see a bagpipe factory so I can play better. Although I'm going to say that from now on. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have to. I have to go to the McCallum bagpipe factory so that I can play my bagpipes better. So what do you say we give this 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 piece of accuracy? A, is two too low? Um, No, two is good. Visiting a bagpipe factory. Though cool, though a lot of fun, yes. probably is not going to have a big effect on your playing. Right. Okay, I think that's fair. Now, I, McCallum does, when I was looking for it, they do have now, um, I think it was in 2020, they did a, like, video tour of their factory. Uh-huh. Uh, that's up on their website now that was a lot of fun to watch, if anybody wants to check that yes. out. It was pretty cool. Okay, now, um, next little bit. They make it to the business district in Glasgow. They're going to the bagpipe factory. And I... Is it is it especially cruel or especially fun to ask you to read this next part? I'm not sure, but would you be willing to read this next part that is titled on our notes, Boys Only? Yes. Um, this one, can we do negative on the points? <laughs> In this case, yes, I think we can. Okay. There's, there's a couple reasons. So let me read it first. Um, the heart of Glasgow's business district, where the factory was located, it it manufactured not only bagpipes, but the proper costumes for men to wear while marching and playing. The visitors were astounded to learn that every tartan used by any Scottish clan could be purchased here. Girls rarely play bagpipes, said the factory guide, who was taking them around. Instead, they get all decked out in their blouses and plaid skirts to do our native dances. 
Where could I purchase a girl's outfit? Nancy asked. The man gave her the name of a shop in the city. Nancy turned to her father. I'd love to have a Douglas Tartan, she said. Mr. Drew grinned. We'll get you a costume right after we leave here. Take take a moment to, to just breathe. Then... Yeah, like, this one makes me gag and get hives. Like, it was going so well. Uh, maybe we start with the, the lower hanging fruit, the, the less triggering bit. Um, the use of the word costume. Okay, thank you. Yes. <laughs> like, four times in that one little yeah. section. It's not a costume. Um, you ever you ever encounter that when like people are hiring you for a for a gig? They ask you if you're gonna come in your costume. <laughs> yeah, I promptly <laughs> tell them I only have my uniform and it will be yeah, like, cleaned and polished and right. look nice. You're looking for a you want me to show up dressed as a Dracula or an inflatable <laughs> T Rex? What what do you think? Yeah, I've said that to somebody. They walked up to me and they're like, I like your costume. I'm like, I didn't dress in my clown costume. <laughs> and they were like, what? And I'm like, this is my uniform. Uniform is different. Excuse me. I also love that um, any any place that is, any any fabric mill that's actually like making tartan fabric will sell men's kilts, but not, like there's no clothing for women here. They have yes. to give her the contact info for a different shop. <laughs> Apparently... We only wear blouses. Yeah, yeah. And plaid <laughs> skirts. Dances. And then, of course, here's the big one, right? Girls rarely play bagpipes. Yes. Now, was it it's true, true though, that like, there are true? less girls yeah. than boys that play bagpipes? I've but been... I wouldn't say rarely. Do you know, Diana? I have been curious about this. How unique it might be, or maybe not unique. Maybe it gets less unique as time goes on. But it seems to me like, like as far as I know, I don't know about right this minute. But Garden Valley has, at times, had more women in it than men. Yes, we and have. Like, definitely, like, in leadership, in our, on our board and stuff like that, there's almost always been more girls than, than boys. Um, mm -hmm. But, uh, and even, like, I zoom out a little bit, and it seems to me like a, there's a, there are a lot of female pipers in Utah. Is that, am I, am I perceiving incorrectly? Or is that unique to Utah? Or is that just becoming more the case as time goes on, you know? I think it's more the case as time goes on. Yeah. Um, I think here, I, th I don't know, though. Because, like, right now, when I go, like, the people who do come because of COVID and things like that. Yeah. I think there's, like, three, like, three girls out of the whole group. And mm. we have, like, 20 people there. Mm. So, right now, there are less girls that are there is that because that men tend to be more reckless and stupid or maybe just <laughs> women end up having to you know be home with their with their children to some degree or i something think like that. i think that's what it started out as i think it was like um i think it was a men's like a male role to play the bagpipes for a long 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 time there's definitely the military tradition right that yeah very military. right yeah so definitely in military but now I wouldn't say girls rarely play pipes. And even like when this book was written, I don't even think I would say it then. Yeah. No, that's interesting. I, I, of course, like I am exactly what people are looking for when they hire, you know, if they have these ideas in mind, like I'm a white guy with facial hair who plays the bagpipe, you know, like <laughs> I, so I fit the bill pretty easily. So, but, but I have encountered it yes. before where people have called me for a gig and I feel bad, Diana, because they might have been talking about you. Uh, because we live so close to each other and they have said to me and it surprised me too that it was a woman who, who said this to me and, it, and she said um, I was going to call this other piper who I had the phone number for but she's a girl and like that's not what I want I want a guy <laughs> and I was like whoa just going to come right out and say it you know <laughs> yeah. like I feel like I've got that's interesting that before but I've never had somebody like say it really directly like that until that, that lady said that it was for a funeral once and I was like oh, oh wow. my goodness well so I, you know what, Diana, I, I think I owe you a gig, so I'll get you one here soon. <laughs> okay. Make up for that one. <laughs> um, yeah, I've I've been mistaken for a boy multiple times in my uniform. <laughs> and how's that that you get mistaken for a boy multiple when times. wearing a kilt? Yeah. <laughs> right. I just, I I don't. Well, to be fair, like when I do get my kilt on and my vest, like I really am a square of clothing. Well, I and with the vest and the button-up shirt and the tie and everything. Yeah, yeah. 
And, like, right now I have short hair, but it was when I had my long curly hair and I'd, like, put it in braids oh, and yeah. things like that. And people just wouldn't pay attention. <laughs> and a boy with beautiful hair. <laughs> I, I, was, I was, like, standing next to, like, Susan and Heidi and Amber and all of these people that were in the band. And they're like, what a nice group of gentlemen. We're so glad you guys could come. And we would just look at each other and we're like, am I invisible? <laughs> I'm like, between the four of us, one of us should look feminine, right? right? I don't know. Oh, that's great. Yeah, so, and then, and now, because my students, I have, a, I, well, there's Ruben, who is taller than I am. Mm. So there's a couple students who are as tall or taller than I am. And I will get mistaken as a student and mm. as a boy until i i have to be very like proactive i'm like yeah. my name is diana and i'm in charge of this group and they can get that shock right off the right. bat out of the way so well it, it, it is it, it's a funny and weird thing well and maybe that makes it even more impressive that uh that nancy drew uh was not bothered by the the gender norms of the day and she just decided <laughs> to go ahead and learn bagpipes um, but what, how many negative points should we give this interaction with bagpipes? <laughs> Cause I don't think there's any chance this is a, does this um, inspire people to play? Well, if it does, they're not the people who we want to meet. <laughs> right. <laughs> they're going to be, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a little disappointed that Nancy doesn't like defend the, well, I just learned how to play Scots yeah. like in like 10 minutes. So don't try she worked super girl. hard on that, man. Yeah. So let's give it um I mean should we give it negative points or just give it a one? We can I'm oh I let's negative see how many times do they say costume? Enough. Okay, they say costume in that paragraph. They only say it twice, but twice. they say it at other points in the story. So. They do. Um we can do one. Uh, but I'll go negative the more times it says costume. Well, I'll tell you what, I know that they use it at least two more times, so we can just knock it down to negative one right now. There we go. Take it right down there. I don't know. We want to take more, well, all right, we'll, we can we can move on with that, but yeah, that, that was a fun passage. Um, so then, let's see, um, okay, then we immediately get another um, interaction with bagpipes. Mm -hmm. um, so here's kind of our how it's made description. Yeah, we're still at the factory. Right, right? we're still at the factory. Um, okay. would you, are you tired of reading? Would you like me to read this one? Or are you good to read? This I can one? do it. Yeah. Go for it. Yeah. Next, the group was shown the various wooden parts of the bagpipes. The chanter, which produced the tune, had a reed at the top. At the lower end was a rubber valve, which closed when necessary to prevent air escaping from the bag. Besides the chanter, there were three pipes for accompaniment. They were called drones. Two of these were tenor and one bass. The guide explained. All the pipes are made of hard African blackwood. The ivory that trims the pipes come from India, and the cane for the reeds that go into the pipes are from Spain. All the parts are screwed together. The splitting of the pale yellow reeds proved to be the most interesting part of the tour for Nancy. She learned that the cane was very carefully split partway down to give just the proper sound. A little later, Nancy's group thanked the guide for his informative talk as they left the factory. Um, as I left the factory, best remark, it's all too complicated for me. I'll stick to the piano. <laughs> and of course, that last one is just another wonderful little stab at, uh, you know, bagpipes are too complicated for women. <laughs> yeah. Also, it's fun that somehow the piano is less complicated. <laughs> right? I I'm way better at the bagpipes than I am at the piano. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe just further pointing out the ridiculousness of the notion. But uh, yeah. what do you think for accuracy in terms of how bagpipes are made and how they go together and stuff? Uh, this one does pretty good, I feel like. The rubber valve part is weird. Yeah, but um, do you think that like maybe the person writing it thought that the, uh, like the, the valve, you know, in the, in the blowpipe is like under the reed, maybe? Right, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of weird because I was like, oh, maybe they were thinking of the practice chanter again, but there's not a valve on the practice chanter. So I'm not really sure. The valve part is weird, but the rest of it, I feel like, is pretty accurate. Yeah, they got the bass and two tenors. Mm -hmm. And the, the African blackwood. Yeah. yeah. And the ivory from India and the reeds from Spain. And they are light yellow. Uh, this part about them all, 
being screwed together. That throws me a little bit, it, but I don't I hmm. don't know all methods. You know, like I I have a standard hide bag, so I always just tie my stuff in. Yeah. There are the hose clamp things. That's a more recent innovation. Yeah. Maybe there I, was a method that had to do I with don't screwing know. things together. I'm not sure. I think it's more. I took it as the pieces like fit together mm. without any. Like a piano really does have like screws that hold the wood pieces together, right? <laughs> but bagpipes, we don't. Like the pieces all fit together. So I don't know if you would how you would describe that. Is it screwed okay. together? Yeah. Like you're not using a screw, like a little metal piece, but they I do see. fit together like a screw would. Right. Okay, that makes more sense. Like the 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 drone, the the lower section of the drone screws into the stock. Right. I yeah. see. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And then the bag is tied on, but all the wood pieces kind of fit together, right? Mm -hmm. um, where we don't use any outside pieces to hold it together. Yeah. Oh, you. I. I see it now. Yeah, that is so, that's pretty good. That. That's how I read it, and I was like, oh, yeah. okay. And then, um, you know, there's not a lot of detail here about uh, reed making. That might mm -hmm. uh, would it make the book more boring or more interesting? I'm not sure. But uh, but what it does say does seem accurate. Like you say, pale yellow and. Yeah, and I think they're talking about the cane drone reeds, which they right. would have been playing on. I don't think synthetic ones were made when this book was written. Yeah. And so this is very accurate for the cane drone reeds. They are um, split. They're sliced part way down um, to give the proper sound. So that part is accurate. Yeah. Oh, beautiful. Um, so this is a pretty good... This has got to score pretty darn well on our, um, yeah, on our, on our thing. What, what do you Other think? than like the valve, yeah. she got everything. So I do like an eight or a nine. Alrighty, I'm gonna give. I'm yeah. Let's go for it. Let's give it a nine. That's pretty darn good. Gets a yeah. nine, and then does it get any bonus points for being entertaining or inspiring someone to play? Um. Let's give it a bonus because it it was very accurate. Or we could just do a 10. Just give it a 10. Yeah, we'll give it that extra point, even though the valve was weird. But it was pretty accurate for how bagpipes are put together. Yeah, yeah definitely impressive. So um, from the bagpipe factory, uh, the group continues with some more sightseeing. Uh, they go to a castle. Uh, there's a scare in the dungeon that turns out to be nothing. They have some tea, and of course, Bess is all about the delicious uh, crumpets and <laughs> cookies that come with the tea. Yes. And somebody says something about, like, well, we won't have to have dinner tonight. And Bess says something like, don't you even start to think we're not having dinner tonight? <laughs> <Something>. <laughs> yes. I feel um. like Bess isn't put in the best light in this particular book, but... I really do like her a little bit more than George in yeah. the other books because she's just so like down to earth and unapologetic of who she is and what she yeah. likes and what she doesn't like. Like she just won't put up with things like if it's if they have to do anything like too overtly athletic, like going on any like dangerous hikes or rock climbing or she's just be like, no, I'm going to go and do this. And she finds a way to help Nancy usually like in her own comfortable way. And I, I really do like that about Bess. Which in all honesty, the impression I'm getting is that like Bess is maybe the most realistic character. <laughs> kind of, yes. Really, like she's like considering the laws of physics and like the chances of them dying and things like that. Yeah. Whereas Nancy like is apparently invincible and so she just does what she wants. <laughs> yes. Um, so then Nancy gets a phone call with Ned and actually I wanted to pull the book up because this is maybe my very favorite part of the whole book. Do you have the book with you? Yeah. Oh, oh yes, I do. <laughs> so it's the, right at the beginning of chapter nine. Okay. Um, and if you want to read from the beginning of chapter nine, um, down to, I can tell you when to stop, but it's before, before Nancy exclaims, you're simply a genius. Um, okay. I see. Okay. Which I like that she talks to Ned all of, like, four times in this book. Mm -hmm. But Ned, like, helps solve half the mystery. It's amazing. Yeah, he's just hard at work back back at home. <laughs> Enrolled in college and can... Right. Yeah, it's amazing. I wish I had that much spare time. Anyways. Okay, chapter nine. As Nancy listened eerily, Ned told her how he had located the writer of warning... 
Oh, sorry. As Nancy listened eagerly, Ned told her how he had located the writer of the warning note. I studied your tracing of the writing. First, like you, I was sure a woman had written the words. You may remember Professor Webster at Emerson. Along with teaching archaeology, he's a handwriting expert. He and I have had many discussions about how the formation of letters is an indication of one's character. You mean, said Nancy, a bold, vertical handwriting usually belongs to a literary person, and jerky, slanted to the right letters are a sign of nervousness? Exactly. After studying the note you received, I figured it had been written by a somewhat shy, motherly person, probably <laughs> elderly. From the type of paper used, I deduced she lived in a middle-income area of town and might shop locally, so I hounded the markets and kept my eyes open. And you found her that way? Nancy asked. Ned chuckled. Sure did. He had taken a young cousin of his I along to the various from, stores. Like, surprise, like he himself is surprised that this works. Because... <laughs> yeah. Um, but they, he says, we stayed near the checkout counter, Ned went on. Whenever an elderly woman came up to the cashier, we'd start talking about palms and watch her reaction. Finally, in one supermarket, we saw a woman tremble violently and asked her point blank about the note. She admitted putting it in your mailbox. Man. You're simply a genius, Nancy exclaimed. <laughs> so this so this thing is called graphology, and it's a real thing, though it's dubious as to whether it's a real thing. You know, like... Yes. Like, I get the impression that it's, like, a, a longer time before this book was written. People had a lot of ideas that, unfortunately, fed into some sort of, like, racist ideologies about how, like, how wide set your eyes were um, could determine whether or not you're likely to be a criminal or the size mm -hmm. of your skull or the distance of the bottom of your nose from the nose bridge, all these kinds of things, right? And I get the sense that it's like out of the same kind of tradition that we're getting this idea that the way a person's handwriting looks says a lot about their personality and you can like deduce all kinds of things about their age and where they're from, but also more importantly, are they likely to be criminals? Are they nervous? You know, are they, are right. they, are they righteous? You know, like all kinds right. of things that you can <laughs> yeah. like, wait a minute. So apparently I, I like that. This. Yeah, because he, like, deduced that she, it was a girl, she lived in the middle-income area of town. Right. <laughs> a motherly person, too, right? Isn't that yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so then, what he decides to do is hang out at the checkout and talk about bombs. <laughs> but only, only when old ladies would right. come to the stand and so then the first old lady who reacts to these two college kids talking about bombs at the grocery store they're like ha must have been you did you write the note and she's like yes i did <laughs> <laughs> well good work ned nickerson <laughs> so mm -hmm. after this wonderful and enlightening conversation uh, the girls have a weekend. Um, then they decide they're going to go see Edinburgh. Do you say Edinburgh? 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 Um, I think it's other? Edinburgh. Edinburgh. But I'm also it's another one don't pronounce things, things like, well, so I say yeah. Edinburgh. It, like this is one of the places. Like the name of it, the, because of the tattoo and everything like that, right? We being in bagpiping, you see this word and hear it so often. But being in Utah, I never having traveled to Scotland myself, you know, like I just. I say these words and hope I'm getting it close. You know what I mean? Yes. Yep. So they go to the castle, the big castle that's in that big city. And uh, they learn about the Jacobite Rebellion. And they see a portrait mm -hmm. of Bonnie Prince Charlie. And they think it's super handsome. And then um, I think it was Bess who says something about uh, how she's so glad that after kilts and Highland dress had been, um, had been outlawed for a time, she's so glad that they're not outlawed anymore because men look so picturesque wearing them. Yes. <laughs> Ten points to Bess. She's, she's absolutely right. Absolutely right. Um, and so then they walk the Royal Mile, the, the Royal Mile, excuse me, and they're tailed by this suspicious uh, gentleman with, uh, with red whiskers. He's the, I, had they, I think they've identified it by now, the, the guy who ran him off the road. Um, mm -hmm. had and I think beard. this is the guy who bought the autograph from the boy back right. home too. Right. Yeah. So he keeps popping up. Keep yes. causing problems. And then we encounter this bit about um, bagpiping history. I do have it highlighted in the notes, but it's kind of giant. We can probably just kind of do an overview. What was the situation? They went to um, a museum, I think, right? Was it at the castle, mm -hmm. at Edinburgh Castle? 
I think so. Yeah. And I think at this point they have, I think this is where they have a driver, um, like showing them around oh, to see all of Fiona? the famous sites. Is this the friend yeah. that had joined them? Yeah. I, I think Fiona is the, the driver. Right. But she's like a younger lady, right? So she's like, yeah, she becomes pals with yeah. them and stuff. Mm -hmm. She's from Sky. That's right. She's from the Isle of Sky. And she's telling him about like bagpipes and, and stuff. And she's like, oh, they're from Egypt and, and from, uh, you know, from, uh, what does she mm -hmm. say? She talks about, um, she talk about Caesar playing them or something like that. Oh, whatever. Um, it's good. Yeah. So, and this encounter with like bagpipe history, it, I felt like was pretty accurate. Yeah. Um, That's because they do too. come from the other countries and Fiona explains, because they're like, well, how come when we think of bagpipes, we only think of Scotland? And Fiona explains that the other countries kind of went towards, like, indoor music. Um, parlor like, music, um, right Yeah, parlor music, dinner music, mm -hmm. things like that. Oh, uh, yes, dinner music. Bagpipes are a little right. loud. <laughs> I wish you hadn't mentioned dinner music. I'm so hungry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah, bagpipes are loud. You're right. Go on. Yeah, and so she... And so she just kind of explains how in Scotland it's, um, they just kept with the, because it's so connected to, I think she says the, the athletic, I was thinking of like the Scottish games, oh, the sure, athletics and yeah. stuff and like their community things that they have. Um, and the bagpipes were played at, you know, funerals and weddings and outdoor events and, so if you have all of these things and the bagpipes are always played, then they're going to stay more mm. relevant because of the culture. Yeah. They're so ingrained in the culture in Scotland. Right. So, yeah. So, well, I like personally, I don't, I don't know a ton about all of this stuff, you know, but it does seem to me, like you said, I like, I did appreciate that. Like the explanation that's given here is sort of like a wider, like saying like, you know, bagpipes came from all these other countries to the east and you know there are different kinds of bagpipes and stuff it seemed like a very oh what's the word for it um i guess just like a very like sort of open acknowledgement that like you know the highland pipes are unique but they're maybe not they're not the only kind of bagpipes in the world they're not the original right. kind of bagpipes, that kind of stuff yeah. you know yeah oh and fiona does tell them that um uh she says our lusty people loved the martial spirit of the music and the pipes and used it for marching troops mm. and that's also very true that they would use it in um, right, the military tradition the military yeah a big part of what preserved it as it is today i suppose as well huh? yeah yeah i think i think that was probably maybe even more so than the yeah. cultural aspect of it that i yeah. learned it makes a lot of sense she mentions she mentions the uh, the McCrimmons as well as being from the Isle of the Sky, which maybe that's the next book we review. I started reading this book just recently about the the McCrimmons. That's like, um, well, I should finish reading it before I talk about it. <laughs> I don't really I don't really know the stories and the legends of like Peabrook being learned, you know, originating with the McCrimmon family and stuff. So I'm like right. just now learning the, these stories. So I don't know enough about it to talk about it. But the girls carry on. And they decide they're going to take a ferry across some water. And this red bearded man shows up again. And once mm -hmm. again drives into their car. And this time they go into the water. Yes. And apparently all Scottish people are just like the nicest, sweetest, most ready to help people in the world. Because like farmers offer to use a tractor to pull it out. So it won't cost them any money to get a tow truck. Uh huh. And this other lady says, come and just stay at my house tonight. You know, like she feeds them, gives them clothes mm -hmm. and everything. Yes, but I feel like this is also a very accurate encounter of Scottish people. Um, my parents have friends from Scotland, and the the mom we called her Gran. Um, she was a lovely, lovely lady. She's passed away now, but a lovely lady. And like, if you, I can imagine being in that spot. And like your car's in the water and this lady comes and offers to let you stay at her house. It would have been like if this were grand for, per se, um, it would have been like so unbelievably rude to decline oh, and offensive. Yeah. The, like how could you not accept this? The hospitality. Yeah, the hospitality yeah. of this lady. So my in my experience of Scottish culture and people, 
um, this, I feel like, could be accurate in some cases. Well, that's lovely and good to hear because I, I as I get older, I'm only ever more cynical. And so it's nice <laughs> to hear about nice people in the world sometimes. <laughs> yes, and, in- and if we take into consideration of, like, when this book was written, that's a good point, even more yeah. so, right? Yeah. Yeah. The idea that people used to be maybe a little more neighborly. Um, and so then we encounter this whistling reed because Nancy is sleeping at this lady's house, right? They're all dried off in bed. Uh-huh. And they're, they're waiting for their car to be fixed. Right. And she yeah. wakes up like at midnight and she hears bagpipes playing and it's Scott yes. LaHaye. And then she hears this big truck driving by and she's like, I just heard a baby lamb bleeding in the back of that truck. And then she she was going to go and follow the truck or something, right? But we've got some some dots are starting to, to connect with, like, that mystery that Ned happened to have read about with the sheep uh-huh. rustlers. Right. And hearing Scott's Wahey again and everything else, right? And then after yeah. the truck has gone by, she hears this weird whistling sound. and she, But she feels sure that it's from bagpipes. And I don't think it actually gives an explanation as to why she's so sure, but she is. <laughs> yes. And so I did message Adrian Melvin about this. Because I was, I'm, I'm taking this seriously. Did wait? Did you tell him you were reading the Nancy Drew book? I absolutely did. <laughs> <laughs> this is fantastic. I, I, I like, want to hear I this story. Like, Adrian, I've been reading this book. Diana and I are going to talk about it. I got to figure this out. So here's what he said to me. So I, first, I, I gave him like the explanation from the book, right? Which is, um, let's see, uh, let's see, let's see, let's see. I said, Adrian, here's the. Uh, so after telling what was up, I was like, here's the explanation that's given by the book. I don't. I didn't know that you could whistle on the bagpipes," said Beth. I suppose you're going to tell us that it's some kind of a signal, George guessed. I wish that I knew, Nancy said thoughtfully, and then she led the way back into the house. Neither Mrs. Drummond, that was the nice lady who was taking him in, nor right. Fiona had awakened. So it was not until morning that Nancy could tell all about the playing of the bagpipes in the truck with the bleeding lamb inside of it. At once, Fiona said that the reed for a chanter could be split to make any kind of sound that one wished. Yeah, that seems a little interesting. <laughs> there's a little hope, a little bit kind of wishful thinking there, doesn't <laughs> I'm gonna it? Try this. <laughs> um, so any kind of sound that one wished, uh, but I don't see why anyone would want to go through the trouble of having it whistle. So then I was like, Adrian, man, what do you think as a reed maker? Um, what do you think they're referring to here? Is it a real thing? Like, what would be whistling on a bagpipe reed, and how would you make it whistle? And then I told him that, like, at the end of the book, uh, Nancy ends up, not to spoil anything for those listening, but uh, Nancy ends up with two chanters. And in one of them, she has a reed that plays normally, and in the other, she has a reed that whistles. And so I was like, is this based off something real, or is it just totally made up for the sake of the story? And then I was like, what about, like, singing in the whistle register? You know, like, some, some mm-hmm. singers can sing way up there. I was like, is there anything like that? And oh, Adrian, um, so you were thinking of, like... The whistle. I was thinking of like, you know, when you um, put air in your bagpipes and you strike in without your chanter coming through in, yeah. and you can hear like the air going through the reed. Yeah. I was thinking of like that noise of like the crappy reed that doesn't quite play. Right. It's not quite <laughs> in yet. It's just like kind of going. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought of when she said whistling reed. I'm like, reeds don't whistle. Yeah. It's but maybe point. if it's high pitched, that right. would make more sense. Well, okay. The, just because she's hearing it from what we perceive as a long distance, right? That's so like, true. It's got to be loud. Yeah. And so Adrian, I don't know if he made up this word or if it's a real word um, for Scottish folks or in Australia where he spent some time or if it's just a typo. But he, his answer was makey up, I would say. Which I think maybe he meant to write made up, but I was like, make yeah. up. Yeah. But I used the word make up in response because I was like, I like that word. I'm going to go with it. <laughs> He's like, yeah, made up, I, th- I would say. He said, um, sometimes an old dried up reed with the sides open, if you blow in that, it'll whistle. Like an old dead reed. Oh, but if it's like yeah. warped enough that the sides open up. And I was like, oh, okay. Well, I figured it was probably made up, but uh, I'm going to put a reed out in the sun to dry it to see if I can get the sides to open up and see if it'll whistle. And I did that. And I have it here. I'm gonna hear. Well, don't get too excited. Here's what it sounds like. Can you hear that? Yeah. Basically, it just sounds like a crappy read. So it's like, <laughs> I don't know. It might just be made up. But hey, tell you what, here's a, here's a chance for us to plug. If there's anybody listening out there, I we do, the show does have an email address and is on Facebook. So the droning on podcast at gmail dot com. Uh, there are links in the description or hop on Facebook. If you know a way to make a Highland bagpipe read whistle, let me know. 
I want to know about it. So, I am not sure where we left off. I got distracted by the whistling reed thing. <laughs> yeah, it's when she hears the whistling reed in the middle of the night over That's the truck. Right. That's right. Um. So, then... What did they do next? They go to like a party. No, they they find they get to Nancy's grandma's house. They finally make yeah. it to Lady Douglas's house. Yeah, they get their car back and they go to Lady Douglas's house. That's right. So finally we're there. Um, Lady Douglas has the a, a, the classic butler. His name is Tweety. Yes. Excellent name for a butler. Someday when I get one, I'll definitely name it, name it Tweety. <laughs> um, and the butler at some point later is suspected of having stolen the. Uh, the precious heirloom uh we learned mm-hmm. that the heirloom itself is a um it's just like a do you say brooch or brooch i say brooch a brooch that has uh what was it like a piece of uh lapis lazuli or something in the middle what was mm-hmm. it? some precious stone it was very yeah it's a precious stone that was incredibly valuable yeah and so that w- it went missing she'd like lady douglas was going to give it to nancy and so she got it out of its box and then she thought she'd try it on one more time and then she went for a walk and then the next morning it wasn't there and she doesn't know where it is yeah. So then Fiona, their friend that they picked up, the gal who's been driving them around, she's got some friends, and they're gonna go hang out in the mountains, do like a camp out. I think so. Yeah. And once again, Mr. Drew, being the uh, free range parent that he is, no big deal. So Nancy and her friends go to hang out with a bunch of Scottish teenagers in the mountains for the night, and uh, <laughs> um, during the outing, Nancy hears faint bagpipe music. Yes. Once else. again, playing the one song that she knows yep, plot, that she's plot. heard like three times so far. Right. Apparently, yep. that's the only song they play that trip. Right. This is apparent. Well, I think it's the only song that ever comes up in the whole story. So. <laughs> I think so. In um, the whole of Scotland, that's all they know. Yeah, Scots Way is the <laughs> the only song that they've got down there, um, or up there. Um, so she's the only one who hears it really, and uh, and she wants to go kind of like look around and and look for clues and stuff. Um. So she gets her friends to go follow her, and then who should show up but the red-bearded man once again. He pushes George down the hill. She falls. They go to help her. They rejoin the group of local kids who are described as um, Fiona's other attractive Scottish friends. Yes. <laughs> Sounds fun. Um, some of them had brought bagpipes themselves as well, so they're doing like this impromptu bagpipe dance concert thing all together in the woods. Sounds like a great time. Uh, then they're trying to sleep, and Nancy hears that whistling reed once again. So then once again, they set off climbing the mountain to go look for clues and they come across like a, like a small valley that's got a little shepherd's hut in it. Yes. So inside the shepherd's hut, they find a Gaelic dictionary and all the words that were on that paper that she found at the beginning of the story are underlined in this dictionary. Yes. But what's more, when she picks up the dictionary, beneath it she finds a paper with her own autograph written thereon boom 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 and this is also typical of nancy drew and her character she has no problem with trespassing (laughs) right she just went right into this cottage (laughs) yes she's got like a like a some sort of like license to license to sleuth oh i'm nancy drew i can go through here i can i can go into a locked house it's fine So then, I don't know, you tell me, Diana, it seems to me like things kind of wrapped up abruptly at this point. They went back to Lady Douglas's house, talked for a minute, decided, let's go back to the sheep pasture one more time, that little cottage, and look for Mm -hmm. more clues. They're driving, they run out of gas, they get a service person to come give them more gas, they get to a phone, they call back to Lady Douglas to tell her what's up, and Lady Douglas is like, hey, guess what, the police caught the bad guy, go down to the station and talk to him. (laughs) <laughs> yeah like oh all right <laughs> um oh 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 but but oh i forgot though um no at this point lady douglas says that the police want to talk to nancy because there's been somebody writing bad checks in nancy's name all over scotland oh right i forgot about that part yeah. yes do you remember going grocery shopping with your parents and they would get the total and then write the total on a check Yes. To pay for uh-huh. it. I was just thinking about that the other day. I was at the checkout and that little table thing, you know, yeah. for checkbooks was, had been removed from our local grocery store. Oh, wow. And I just thought, huh, how long has that little table been sitting there, you know? Yeah. Worn thin from, from checkbooks. 
So anyway, I think that immediately the reader as well as Nancy draws the conclusion that like, ah, that autograph that was on the paper, right? Somebody's forging yeah. checks. One of the police officers believes her, but another one does not. And so then while the girls are driving to go back and check out that little cottage again, they come across a forest fire. Yes. And they put it out with brooms. I didn't that they happen to have in up. the car. It's apparently a thing. Or no, they find... No, there's like did a they shed find a with, shed? Yeah. yeah. A shed with like twig brooms in it. Yeah. Um, and they just like stamp out a forest fire. <laughs> so then the police pull up behind them and the one who had been suspicious of her gets out and goes, well, I'm sure that no check forger would ever take the time to stop and put out a forest fire. <laughs> <laughs> Once a bad guy, always a bad guy. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not a good bone in your body if you write a bad check. Yep, yep. So don't don't be a forger. And if you ever want to convince the police of your innocence, just find a forest <laughs> fire, put it out with a broom. <laughs> to, to to an extra good deed for any non good deeds that you happen to do. Right. So then they get called in um, after they'd called Lady Douglas. Somebody has been apprehended. They get to the police station. There's the guy with the red beard. The police have not thought to remove the beard. I guess it was a really good one. They didn't realize it was fake. I guess. And Nancy's like, hey, you should take the beard off of him. It's fake. And they do, and she recognizes the person. It's Paul <laughs> yeah. Petrie. Paul Petrie from her old hometown. Has Did Paul Petrie come up in other stories, Diana, or is he a new character just for the sake of this story? Um, I think he's a new character. Mm -hmm. Well, that would make sense. You don't really want yeah. to have a, a local hometown criminal showing up in multiple stories, right? Yeah. I think... Like I don't think there are any that repeat in stories. Well, it's because Nancy's justice is swift and everlasting. So once she puts the bad yeah. guy behind bars, they never get out. Yeah. Um. So here, they've... So they figured out, like, who wanted her autograph. But they don't know... The brooch is still missing, and um, the story that Ned read about, about the sheep herders, hasn't been solved either. So they go back to the grandmother's house, mm -hmm. and Nancy conjures the idea to go try and find those sheep herders. Right. Because they dress up for it. That's right. They, Remember? They go yeah. Up her, they go up into Lady Douglas's attic, right? Yes. And, like, they each have a different tartan. Yeah, so Lady Douglas just has these, like, trunks, I guess, yeah. of kilts, but not even, like, just the family kilt, just different kinds of tartan. Right, yeah. <laughs> um, so Nancy, Bess, and George all um, get dressed into a different color of tartan that into offsets their lovely right? features different, and matches their hair. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then they, I think they go camp again in the forest that's right to go um to go catch to go try and find these sheep herders yeah and and this is where nancy comes up with the idea like she's like she thinks she's figured out what the song scots wahay and the whistle sound are being used for right signals. yeah and wasn't it didn't didn't tweety the butler help her like fix up a reed to whistle like he knew like he knew about bagpipes. yeah tweety the butler he has a set of bagpipes but he doesn't know how to play right right so he sets up this set of bagpipes he has multiple sets of bagpipes mm -hmm. he doesn't know how to play of course he does so he helps nancy set up a set of bagpipes that she can take on this little excursion he's a scottish butler of course he has multiple sets of bagpipes even though he doesn't know how to play <laughs> standard right um, yeah, so that, that's my, that was my last, like, bagpipe encounter that bothered me. <laughs> <laughs> you want to give that one a score? Why, why does he, yeah. Why uh, is he hoarding bagpipes? <laughs> <laughs> and doesn't bother to learn how to play. Oh. Um, because he's either bought them, and I don't know why he would buy more than one set and not learn, or he inherited them. Which is even worse, in my opinion, because yeah. I think it would be cool to have a set of bagpipes that you've inherited oh, yeah. to play on. Talk so this actors. one, yeah, this one's like a, a solid zero, maybe solid even a negative. Zero. Okay, that's yeah. another negative one then. And yeah. going back, I figured we could probably give uh, 
based off what Adrian could tell us about whistling on the bagpipes in the first place, I'm thinking that's like a four. Like it's possible, but we sure can't figure out exactly what it is. Yeah. And then the bagpipe history, I thought we could give it a more positive score because at least it's a little bit more wide, wide sweeping, a little more global. So maybe like yeah. a seven there. Yeah, that one's good. And so Tweety's like, hey, we've got these prehistoric ru ruins over here. Let's go check over there because it might be a place that thieves would hide out. And um, so they go over there and they check it out. And I think they found like little tufts of wool and stuff like that, like little hints that like yeah. might have been going on up there. Yeah. And then, yeah, Fiona was like, do you think that the, the sheep thieves were using this place? And Nancy's like, yeah, I think that they I think they were. And I think that they only wanted the wool and the skins. Yeah, well, because I, I think they find the ruins and then they go back to Lady Douglas's house and they get their kilts and their bagpipes which is funny because it says they put on kilts here, even though earlier in the book they're like, girls don't wear kilts right, or play bagpipes. <laughs> and then here Nancy redeems herself a little bit by dressing everyone in a kilt and getting some bagpipes and figuring oh. that she can probably play Scots Wahey on the full set of bagpipes. Yeah, probably handle it. Yeah, and this is the part where she says, as uh, she's getting everything together, she says to Tweety, or no, she says to Lady Douglas, she's like, I'll need a chanter that can produce a whistle. Can you obtain one for me? And Lady Douglas is like, oh, Tweety was once a reed maker in a factory. <laughs> yeah. He has several bagpipes, though he can't play. <laughs> uh, and then so then she pulls the bell cord and Tweety comes in and he's all for helping out. Yeah, yeah. So he helps them get their reed and everything. And the adventures, like, don't even stop there because the girls go out with their kilts on and their camping gear and there's even like a bobcat encounter oh i forgot about the bobcat while they're the out tree, right? yeah and they actually do points to nancy they do get the police to help them for part of it so they have these like two police officers out on this like stakeout <laughs> With these, like, three teenage girls. Right. The um, like, yeah, I trust them. No, yeah, <laughs> so. Um, and they have, like, two different groups, so they, like, figure out how to catch these bad guys that are stealing sheep. Right, so Nancy's going to play Scots Wahey, and that, what is that? That means something like the sheep are ready for you to come pick them up or something like that. Yeah, it has to do with the transporting of the sheep. So right. Nancy, like, tricks them to like go early or something like that so that the policeman can catch them in the act yeah because they were um they were like drugging the sheep to put him to sleep and then hauling them right to the brock to uh to skin him there i guess yeah to and get so there then, and so then Chan so then she plays with scott's Wahe, signals them they're they're coming out and then the police are like wait 20 minutes and then do the whistle thing and so then she swaps out to the whistly chanter yeah plays the whistle signal so and they they do find the brooch but i think it's before this part yeah well hadn't it been well what was it they they get was it pete petrie still that they um they sit down they're like all right we got the whole thing figured out and they basically tell him how he was doing the crimes yeah and wasn't it his wife who once they dressed her up she had bore a passing resemblance to nancy and so mm -hmm. she was the one going around bouncing checks yeah she was bouncing checks and i think he was also at the great great grandmother's house and he like saw the grandmother wearing this lovely brooch and he tricked uh, her into dropping it on accident and then like it but then he threw it in the lake or something like he heard the dog barking i can't remember now. yeah yeah he ends up yeah the, there was the dog the dog dies because of the petri guy i think right. Yeah. I do appreciate this part where um, it says, uh, Nancy said that she felt very sorry that Petrie's wife had been dragged into the men's dishonest activities. Which might be true, you know, but I, it reminds me of the old Adam West um, Batman show. Um, yeah. Where, like, any time there was a, a woman villain, it was always, like, such a tragedy. Like, how could it be that, I mean, I understand men becoming criminals, but... <laughs> for, the, for the female form to engage in crime just seems un, unheard of and unintentional. Yeah. What is the word? Unfathomable. <laughs> Which I don't know. You know, like I don't know. Is that a compliment or not? It, it feel it feels like um, it's like an outgrowth of that. What do you call it? That um, like pedestal version mm -hmm. of sexism, where it's like 
No, wi women women are are so gentle and good because they're not smart enough to be bad or something. Right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. Yeah, so all in this in this trip of like a week, I think <laughs> Nancy finds the the missing sheep, the sheep rustlers, they get put in jail. They find the brooch. She finds who was asking for her autograph. And she learns to play bagpipes. Don't forget that. Yeah, and she learns how to play bagpipes. Play bagpipes. She gets a kilt. It's another another good adventure for Nancy Drew and friends. And then I, I love this line as, as it's kind of wrapping up. Ned Nickerson says, um, And listen, don't you dare find another mystery until the June fraternity dance is over. I promise, <laughs> says Nancy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because she's still just a carefree teenager. <laughs> the college boyfriend. She's got to go to that dance. Yeah. And Ned doesn't want it spoiled. So, how does this one rank for you, Diana, as somebody who has consumed multiple Nancy Drew books? This book is action-packed. There's a lot in it, right? Yeah. I did yeah, there it. is. Like, I was like, man, is this what all of them are like? Because we've got like six different storylines going on here all at once. Yeah. Um, no, not all of them have multiple mysteries to be solved in one book. Most of them, I would say, that I have read is usually just one mystery and maybe, like, one plus a sub. But I think this one has, like, three yeah. <laughs> in it. Three main ones. Yeah. So, if you could figure out how to play a whistling sound on your bagpipes, it might be an appropriate thing for, uh, for Halloween. But if you can't, do you have any tunes that you like to play or that you think would be especially good for Halloween Tide? Ooh. Um, not off the top of my head. I, that's one holiday that I haven't, like, connected tunes to. Mm. Do I, you um, have any that you play for Halloween? Oh, Pumpkin's Fancy. Oh, yeah. That's Maybe that's one. more of a harvest tune. <laughs> not a <laughs> Halloween tune. But uh, that's, the, that's the only one that really came to mind. Well, Hellbound Train makes sense, doesn't it? Hellbound Train. Yeah, yeah, of, that's a good one. Is Hell scary? Yeah, I think so, probably, right? <laughs> yeah. Witches and demons and all that. Um, there probably are some, though, that I just have not been introduced to yet, though. Yeah. I was just trying to tabulate our uh, final score for the book, um, but then I divided it wrong, so I have to add it back up again. So divide by one, two, three, four, five. Final score, four. <laughs> <laughs> I actually thought I was going to score higher than that. <laughs> yeah, we got some serious, uh, some serious, um, some serious downgrades in the scoring for those uh, for the sexism of the past, I suppose. Mm, yeah. And that and calling the uniform a costume. That's yeah, that one sin. bugged me too much. If it's just if it's just bagpipes though, if we took out like the costume and the sexism, just the bagpipes, I feel like did pretty good. It did pretty darn good, yeah. I yeah. definitely was pleasantly surprised. I was impressed by a lot of the detail that was in there with, yeah. with bagpipes. It was so accurate. Yeah, because you kind of wonder in some of the things you read, you're like, oh.